Hi, everybody. My name is Julia. I'm a participant who's coming later in the year in October, late October. I hope you guys are all having a great enhancement together. Today, I want to talk to you about my project that I'll be doing in Chile, uh, looking at temperature sensing in Antarctic fish. Currently, I am at my home institution at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And I'll be uh, conducting this project at the Universidad Austral de Chile in Valdivia. Um, so here I'm showing you a map of one of the fish that I'm interested, uh, the range of one of the fish that I'm interested in studying. Uh, you can see here in, in red and yellow where the fish occurs all around the coast of Antarctica. Uh, this fish is Nodothenia coriceps, this lovely guy here. Um, and we're really used to looking at maps with this orientation um, with a land-based orientation because of course we primarily live on the land. But if we were a fish, we might draw this world map uh, pretty differently. So if you look at a map of the world uh, oriented around the oceans, uh, this is called the spillhouse projection. This is what it looks like. And you can see that a map of the world oceans has Antarctica right in the center uh, and the Southern Ocean, which is the ocean that surrounds Antarctica, connects all the other oceans uh, in the world and is the center of the world ocean. And so this makes it really important um, for understanding uh, climate change dynamics and changes uh, on Earth and in the ocean. Um, but it's actually quite isolated, even though it's in the center of the world ocean, and that's because of the Antarctic circumpolar current, which I'm showing here with this white line. Uh, you can see this is the Drake Passage here between Chile and the Antarctic Peninsula. And then these colors here show the depth of the ocean, um, and you can see that there's a shallow shelf, quite a wide shallow shelf that runs all around uh, the continent of Antarctica. And this is where the fish live all around Antarctica, and it's, it's quite a wide area here. But it's also very icy and cold, as you can imagine. So this is a, a map showing the extent of sea ice in uh, September of 2009. The red is the sea ice here. And then the temperature here in degrees Celsius of the sea surface temperature is um, below zero at the edge of the ice um, and gets warmer as you go further north. And if you take temperature recordings, so for example, this is at McMurdo Station, which is right here, um, between 25 and 40 meters in depth. Uh, these are temperature recordings over um, several years. You can see that uh, the temperature rises to a maximum of, of only about half a degree Celsius in the summer and drops down to negative 1.8 degrees Celsius, which is the freezing point of seawater during the winter where it's quite stable at that temperature. Um, and then it, it only, it doesn't really ever get above the freezing point of water above zero. Um, and so it is quite cold and quite stable in this environment. And the fish fauna that have evolved to live there um, have a lot of interesting adaptations in order to survive in these kind of temperatures. Primarily, they have about twice the amount of salt in their blood and tissues compared to other fish. That depresses the freezing point to around negative one degree. And because it actually gets colder than that, like I said, it's generally in the winter negative 1.86 degrees Celsius. They also express these antifreeze glycoproteins uh, or AFGPs. And these are proteins that bind to the ice crystals as they form and prevent them from growing any larger. So if they kept growing, they would freeze the fish into a little fish sickle. Instead, these proteins bind to the ice crystals and prevent that from happening. So they do have these like floating ice crystals that are in their tissues and in their blood, in their uh, GI tract especially, they ingest a lot of ice, but these proteins bind to the ice and prevent them from doing any damage. And then in the summer, when the temperature goes above this negative one degree freezing point of their body fluids, the ice melts and uh, they decrease their ice load. So this evolution of the, of the antifreeze glycoproteins of the AFGPs allowed this group of fish to, to be really successful in the cold Southern Ocean. So 
This is a tree, a taxonomy of the notathenoid fishes, and you can see it's scaled here in millions of years. So the, the uh, common ancestor of all of these fish lived about 90 million years ago. And this group here uh, are the Antarctic the uh, families that live in the Antarctic. And so after the evolution of these antifreeze glycoproteins, they diversified into quite a few species. This is a very high rate of speciation over this amount of time um, because of the evolution of these proteins. And these non-Antarctic sort of more ancestral or basal species um, had never evolved to live at these cold temperatures. And this evolution of the, um, of the antifreeze proteins and also the diversification of these groups occurred at the same time as the Southern Ocean cooled. So this is an isotope of oxygen that indicates what the temperature was like um, in the ocean over time. And you can see that the, the ocean has been cooling as these fish uh, have diversified and speciated. And so I'm interested in looking at how these fish sense these temperatures at such a cold, uh, in such a cold environment and how that might be affected by climate change, how that might evolve under climate change. And it's really critical for uh, aquatic organisms and marine organisms to sense temperature because they are generally the temperature of their environment. And so they need to be able to sense that temperature and select a good temperature for their bodies um, by moving around in the water. And there, this is um, a map showing some groups of marine organisms that have shifted their range um, due to the changing climate and due to temperature changes. And so you can see that's not always directly north, but they track their local temperature changes quite well. So how do animals sense temperature? So we uh, have sense, uh, sensory nerves in our skin that uh, sense changes in temperature and send signals through the spinal cord to the brain when the brain makes decisions about um, appropriate behaviors in response to that temperature that was sensed. Um, and fish also have this same system and they also have temperature sensitive neurons that are in their brain itself. So this is a map of neurons in the zebrafish brain. This is a top view and this is a side view here and you can see that there are some sections of the brain that have quite a few heat responsive neurons um, and some sections that have fewer heat responsive neurons. These um, dots here show the trigeminal ganglion, which are these peripheral sensory nerves that innervate the face. And so these are uh, the, the sort of peripheral temperature sensors and then there's the central temperature sensors in fish because of course their whole body as I said, the, their whole body is the temperature of the environment. So they're sort of sensing it with both, both at the periphery and at the, their nervous system center. So for my project, I'm gonna be collecting both these tissues um, in the brain of fish. So the, the central areas of temperature sensation and also the peripheral nerves and then uh, reference tissues as well. And I'll be doing this um, by joining the Chilean Antarctic Expedition with the Instituto Antarctico Chileno or INAC. Um, and we're gonna go to um, the O'Higgins base, which is here on the peninsula. And it looks like this. And we're gonna be fishing here off the dock and uh, collecting fish and dissecting them for these temperature sensitive tissues. Um, I'll be going there with Dr. Leila Cardenas. Um, and I'm really lucky and excited to be able to join this expedition. And these are the fish that I'm targeting. So this Notathenia cordyceps here, this is Notathenia rossi, who's, that is related to Notathenia cordyceps, the Ar Antarctic spiny plunder fish here, Harpagifer antarcticus, and an ice fish here, Shamsosabalus gunerii. Um, hopefully I'll be able to catch all of these guys and then pull out these temperature sensitive tissues and also their reference tissues. But of course I need something to compare them to. So I can't just study just the Antarctic fish. I need a, a, a reference or something to, to tell, to show me what is, um, how to compare these, the, the, what I see in the Antarctic fish. Um, and you can see that there are these, as I said before, there are these ancestral groups that never evolved to live in Antarctic temperatures. But the most recent common ancestor with the Antarctic group here is 
uh, lived more than 40 million years ago. And so there's that's a lot of time and a lot of things could have occurred in 40 million years that have nothing to do with in, adapting to the Antarctic, but might be just random. And so that really decreases the signal to noise if I was comparing these uh, Antarctic species to these uh, non-Antarctic species. So instead, I'm gonna be taking advantage of an interesting uh, thing that has occurred since these fish evolved to live in the, in the Southern Ocean, which is that the Antarctic polar front has moved north and south over millions of years. So you can see that this is just an example, but sometimes the polar front, which is the PF here, is further north, and then sometimes it's further south, uh, and it, it moves over millions of years. And that allows some groups of fish to move from the Antarctic um, back to temp the temperate waters. And so that's occurred um, several times in the Antarctic group. And so I have, there's these um, closely related species to the ones I showed you before, which can all be found around mainland Chile. So there's Harpagiferbus finis, Nordicinia angustata, and Champsocephalus esox. So these have all independently shifted from the Southern Ocean to more Northern areas around mainland Chile. And so that allows me not only to be able to look for evolutionary signals over a shorter amount of time, but also do it across independent occurrences. So this has happened at least three times independently. And so if I see the same change three times independently, that increases my confidence that that is something that is significant, uh, evolutionary sign evolutionarily significant. So then what? So I'm gonna bring the tissues back to Illinois and uh, sequence them, do genetic sequencing to see what uh, they are expressing. And specifically, I'm looking at these uh, TRIP channels. These are transient receptor potential or TRIP channels, which are proteins that are in the sensory nerve and uh, respond to heat. So when you apply heat to these proteins, they open, they allow ions to flow into the cell that depolarizes the sensory neuron and sends the signal to the brain. And there's lots of these different trip channels across many different um, organisms across animals all use these, these channels for sensing temperature. So a lot of them have been studied in mice, but also they're in amphibians and insects, and they all have different temperature uh, sensing ranges. And um, so I'm gonna be looking at the evolution of these channels in these uh, in these different tissues across the different species, fish species. And um, finally, I'm also going to be looking at characterizing these channels um, in the Brauchi lab with, uh, with Dr. Sebastian Brauchi, who is um, also at the Universidad Astral de Chile. And he is an expert in these TRIP channels. And his lab does a lot of electrophysiology. This is just an example here of you have a cell that might be expressing something you're interested in, and you can measure different uh, things about that cell and about the channels using electrophysiology. So I'm going to be also going to his lab and learning some new techniques that will allow me to hopefully eventually functionally characterize the channels that I am studying uh, through catching these fish in Chile and Antarctica. Okay, so thank you so much for your attention. Um, I hope to meet some of you while I'm there. Please feel, here's my email. Um, please feel free to reach out uh, for any reason. And uh, yeah, I'm really grateful to Fulbright Chile and to all of these organizations for giving me this opportunity. And yeah, thank you so much.